Thank you all for coming to um, Design Is um, for our third installment here. Um, we set up this uh, session in this series um, to create a space for a dialogue about um, ethical design, the creative process, and um, to encourage and support everyone to design a future that we all want to be a part of. And we are very excited um, to have with us today Sonongo. Um, he is a senior art director at um, Constructive, um, an agency where he's working on um, design for positive um, social impact. Um, and he is also the founder of uh, Pixel Fable, which is a collection of Afrofuturist fables. Um, very great, exciting work. And uh, we are really happy to have him here from New York. So um, with that, I would like to welcome Sonongo. Thank you. Hey, everybody. All right, uh, first of all, yes, thank you very much for having me here. Um, and uh, I hope to, to do you all justice. I realize it's right before the holiday weekend. So first of all, hello, um, that's me on Twitter. Uh, and my website. Now you can, of course, follow along with work there and uh, follow along with this conversation on Twitter if you so choose. So there's this idea of culturally responsive design uh, that I've been exploring for a number of years, trying to find out what it means both for myself as a designer, as an art director, as an illustrator, um, and also for the design community at large. And so what I'm hoping to do today is to speak a little bit about what this means for me and speak a little bit about what I think you all can do uh, to build this and to encourage this in your own design practice. It's a f important for me, of course, to, to go into background a little bit. Um, and uh, I want to kind of say that throughout all of the things that I'm doing and the work that I'm going to be showing, I try to reference where I'm from and the experiences and the cultures that I've been through. Um, and so I started off as a very young child uh, in Nigeria. Now, I was born and raised in West Africa. Uh, my father is Nigerian. Mother was an American from Fresno, uh, Hanford, actually, um, if any of you are from around there. And uh, spent my formative years there. Um, and throughout all of that, living in the north of Nigeria in a majority Muslim area, being from a Christian family, and uh, really just kind of experiencing what that was like, uh, was very, very formative for me. After high school, uh, I moved to Michigan. <laughs> So from sub-Saharan West Africa to the, the cold wasteland of um, the Midwest and experienced snow for the first time that I could remember and other very interesting things. And was there for about five years and after that I decided I needed another change and I moved to Japan. I lived in Japan for about seven years, uh, first as a teacher and then I worked as a designer and uh, built websites, uh, did branding and so on. And throughout all of these experiences, again, it, made me realize how much I lived in that liminal space. And what I mean is that space between two cultures. Uh, in Nigeria, we call ourselves third culture kids, and I'm sure many of you who have grown up elsewhere also refer to yourselves in the same way. Being Nigerian, but also American. Uh, being in between, but also not. Speaking one language, but your relatives asking you to be able to speak another. And so when I was in Japan, I was in yet another liminal space where I was not Japanese, not American, not Nigerian, something else. And so throughout the work that I've done and the work that I explore, I try and find out what that actually means in a multicultural world. The point that I want to make, of course, is that we do design for numerous cultures, whether we know it or not. Uh, we all know very well the power of the web and the way that our content flows across borders, across all sorts of inter and intranets. And so I really think it's important for us to first realize this and then ask ourselves what we can do to help support this and uh, to make it more of a reality in our own work. So in order to do that, uh, I want to kind of present these ideas of cultural variables. Uh, there was a researcher, his name is Geert Hofsted, uh, did a lot of research when he was at IBM about the ways that corporate culture organizes itself. And that's mostly internal. But they also did research about the way that uh, society organizes itself on a national level. So we're talking about different nations, uh, different you know, groups of people. And while he did a lot of research about this, I've tried to find ways to adapt this to the design practice. And I'll say that 
we're not necessarily saying that all people from X country do Y. We're not saying that just because you're from this place or you speak that language, you automatically think like, eh. Instead, what we're trying to find are some rules and some organizing principles for those societies so that we can start to analyze how design works and doesn't work for them. And so I really want to say that you know, this multicultural design should really start to expose some of those unwritten rules in society, uh, some of those things that we may take for granted and that they take for granted, um, but need to perhaps be spoken about. And so the first variable is that of a high context or a low context culture. Now, high context cultures are ones in which there's a lot of implicit knowledge. Uh, this means that things are simply understood. Uh, the lines are read in between. The air is read. And things are not necessarily documented in an explicit way. Uh, my experience in Japan was that it is an extremely high context culture. In contrast, we have low context cultures, ones in which there's a lot of explicit knowledge. Things are written down, they may be more legalistic, um, and the rules and operating procedures for that society and that culture uh, are well documented. A good way to think about this is responsibility for understanding in a conversation. I was a teacher for about five years uh, in Japan, and one of the things that was quite difficult was the ways that we would teach students, this was English conversation, ways that we teach students to participate and, and be part of conversation in English. And uh, I had a manager who told me, she said, um, one of the things that you need to realize is who is responsibility, who's responsible for understanding. And perhaps in Japan, the responsibility for understanding lies with the listener. It's their job to pick it up, to read the air. Whereas, let's say in the West, in the United States, the responsibility for understanding is on the speaker. If I talk and you don't get it, that's my fault. And so understanding that lets us start to see some design treatments and ideas in a little bit of a different way. This is a site, I don't know if it's still live, but I just loved it so much, so I decided to talk about it. And this is for Toji Temple. Uh, Toji is one of the oldest wooden pagodas uh, in Japan and is a very, very beautiful cultural site. And so here they have their, their, their website. You'll notice a few things, first of all. The text written vertically, which is a sign uh, in Japan of organizations that want to see, be seen as traditional or um, you know, referencing older culture, more modern or mo more modest and staid. And so their logo is, of course, vertical. It's written in script. And you also see this uh, World Heritage logo. Uh, this is another thing which indicates the you know, kind of cultural heft that Toji Temple has. And a lot of Japanese organizations really go out for these because it's helpful for tourism, uh, which is a point that I'll come back to in a second. And so looking at this, you're like, wow, that's really cool. You can see the menu on the top left side, which is written vertically. Awesome. <laughs> but then you realize that they went an extra step and they wanted to make sure that the menu was readable for English tourists who were visiting Toji Temple. And so what they did was wrote the English on its side to mimic what they were doing in their own language. And so you have this mixture of metaphors in a way in which a high context uh, language treatment, typ typographic treatment, doesn't really support itself in English. The next variable is that of collectivism versus individualism. Uh, just as the names would imply, collectivist societies are ones in which people subsume themselves in favor of the group. Uh, they put the group first. An individualistic society, uh, perhaps like the US and many others, uh, are ones in which the individual comes first and the group is much less important. And as you can imagine, this manifests itself in some very interesting ways when it comes to design. Some of the things that we do involve the research around what we're designing, what we're building, the products that we're making. And uh, Apala Chavan is a designer and a researcher. Uh, she works at the Institute of Customer Experience as a CEO. And I saw a story that she told some time ago, and I thought it was really, really just a, a great illustration of how this works. So uh, Chavan was doing some research about a website to sell train tickets, and I believe this was in India. And so she had a group of women who came, and she was going to do some you know, qualitative, quantitative testing. And so began to ask them a few questions about how the interface was working or not. What do you think? How is it for you? Et cetera, et cetera, as you might do. Well, the answers weren't really that forthcoming. Uh, there was maybe some hemming and hawing, and mm, she wasn't getting what she wanted. And she realized that there was perhaps a cultural inhibition against being too critical about one person's work or being too open with your personal opinions and so on. 
And so she decided to take a little bit of a different tack. She said, all right, hold on. I'd like you to imagine that you are uh, a mother and your daughter lives in the next town over. You've just found out that the, the man your daughter is going to marry tomorrow uh, is a bad guy. Uh, he is a murderer, <laughs> a crook, and to top it all off, he has another family in another town. And so you need to get to the next town before the wedding tomorrow in order to stop this thing. Immediately, the answers start coming. Well, if that were me, I would definitely move this button up or I'd move this over here in order to accommodate that, in order to make sure I could get there in time to, to save her from this, this terrible tragedy. And so by simply acknowledging the way that a society may be either collectivist or individualistic, uh, we can adjust our research practices to, to cope with that. And so the point I'll make here simply is that understanding what an interface is, this is a button, is very different from accepting them. This button is gonna help me save my daughter's marriage or career or whatever. The next cultural variable is that of high power versus low power distance. Um, when Geert Hosted was researching this, of course, he was looking at business culture first. And so uh, when we speak about high power distance cultures and societies, we're very mainly talking about ones in which the boss is supreme and uh, people offer a lot of respect to elders and those in positions of power. Uh, status symbols are huge, the corner office. Uh, in contrast, a low power distance society is one in which people are generally seen to be at about the same level. You refer to your boss as Bob or Jane instead of Mr. or Mrs. And so this, again, manifests itself in some very interesting ways. It's a photograph by Oscar Ruiz that he did with Publicis Mexico. And I'll ask you just to look at this for a second. It's not photoshopped whatsoever. Uh, there's no retouching here, there's nothing going on except for just a straight up photograph, either from a drone or helicopter. And this always surprises people when I show them. Uh, and all of these photographs in this series are absolutely stunning. Uh, they're all like this. And we see this huge divide between the have-nots there on the left-hand side and the haves on the right. We say to ourselves, wow, I'm really glad I don't live in a society where that is necessarily possible or happens uh, with any regularity. And then we see projects like this. Uh, the New Yorker did an inequality map, uh, which took data from the census about median incomes and then mapped it against the New York City subway. And so we see some train stations which have fabulous wealth, comparatively. I worked for a number of years on Canal Street, which is the, the station that's highlighted uh, right off the A. And uh, it's a pretty, it's Tribeca, you know, the Tribeca Film Festival and all of that. And so, it, we have 150,000, give or take, a year as a median income for this area. You go right across the river to Brooklyn, and that drops way down. And so even though we may not imagine that this is a society that we live in, simply by looking at the data and illustrating it and putting this up online in a way that makes sense, we see that this is, in fact, true. The next variable is that of fast versus slow messaging. And really what this is asking and exploring is how much people are comfortable with indulgence, uh, how much they're comfortable with restraint, uh, both in the communications that they get and also the way that they interact with people online. And I'd like to just show a few examples of what this means when we talk politically and when we talk about taxes and the ways that we interact with our government. Now, gov.uk is very rightly held up as one of the examples of service design of user-centered uh, content strategy, and really the government doing all that it can in order to make its own workings clear to its own people. Uh, I love to make the point that gov.uk is something that the people of the UK paid for because they really needed to make sure that their government was open and accessible as quickly as possible. In one or two clicks, you can get information about daycare, the VAT, uh, how the government works, who's my prime minister. And this is a really, really beautiful and award-winning example of what happens when people value that fast messaging. I found this project, the Tropicana Vernacular, uh, by Lobregat Belaguer, a Filipino designer, writer. And in that, uh, Belaguer talks about how the practice of design is not necessarily valued as much in the Philippines, and how uh, graphic designers are perhaps called technicians. Uh, they're called artists, and not referred to by the tasks that they actually do. 
uh, they're asked to simply move pixels around rather than uh, perhaps using their brains to come up with uh, solutions, which is something that we do. And we see there uh, on the left-hand side a sign for one of these quote-unquote design spots. And the phrase at the top, I think, is so beautiful. It says, a business without signs is a sign of no business. It's true. It's really true. Um, and we see all the other things that this, this business can take care of for you, the signs and tarps. And then on the right, we see what this actually means in practice. And here we have a bunch of uh, politically themed signs. Um, and as much as we may snicker at the typography, I'm not going to call it, but you know what it is that I'm looking at there in green uh, and yellow. Um, <clears throat> don't say it. But this is a way that these politicians communicate with their constituents. Um, and I know that this is advertising in a way that gov.uk is not. But there is something very interesting about how this works in that society. And Belaguer says that in the Philippines, we have a people whose idea of visual pleasure is an explosion of the colors and textures that constitute the experience of community. And this is a very different way of looking at what messages are and how they reach you, with what speed, and with what clarity. The next variable is that of ambiguity versus directness. Uh, there's no big secret here. How much do you accept and how much are you comfortable with messages that, and design that doesn't necessarily speak with clarity? And how much do you need and crave to be spoken to or to interact with something in a very direct way? In the Marshall Islands until very, very recently, uh, we saw these stick charts, which were maps of the waves and the swells around certain island groups. And at first glance, you have to say, these are pretty opaque. I look at that and I would immediately think that this is art. And in a way, it is. But this is also a map. Uh, this is very, very different from what we would see in a lot of other places and very different from what we assume is cartography. And yet, we look at other examples that we are more comfortable with, where we're using algorithms and data and data scientists working with designers to start overlaying mapping textures and photographs onto, quote unquote, our world. And it really raises a question about which one of these is ambiguous and which one of these is direct. There's something very beautiful about both of these uh, in their own way. And I say all that to really make the point clear that all of these design choices that we make, all of these things that we do and that we build, they come with these pre-existing assumptions, pre-existing pre conditions. And in order for us to be able to make better work, do cooler things online, and speak to our customers and our users, I think that we need to start challenging some of those and looking at what those cultural variables actually are. I'll take a little bit of a tangent here to talk about this idea of code switching, uh, which has become more popular in the US, um, but has always been a thing. I know that the black American experience isn't one that I totally understand. I'm Nigerian, and so I'm technically African American, uh, but I believe that there is a very deep well um, of this idea of code switching in the black American community in the US. And to really illustrate what this means, you know, we're talking about the ability to either, in communication, emphasize or minimize our social differences, uh, to use different language, different vernacular when we're in different situations. We can do this, again, to be better equipped to speak with people. Uh, so there's my interview language. Or we can use this to be more impenetrable, and you look at the way that the financial analysts and so on talk on TV. And so being able to switch between those uh, becomes an important way to communicate with people or to not communicate with them. But what if we do want to? I mean, we do want to communicate with people, right? So uh, here's an example that I think really, really brings it home. Uh, so Bridge is an app that's built on Viber. It's using their API, which, as I understand, is one of the only ones that allowed them to do this. And uh, what this is is the ability to text somebody, uh, a group of translators, and then get back a translation which matches what you need. And this is used uh, so that uh, aid workers can communicate with refugees and uh, immigrants. And because of the wealth of different types of Arabic and regional differences and so on, this is a really great example of how we can use technology in order to minimize those differences and to make sure that we can get help to the people who need it in a way that they can understand it. So I really, really love this project. And uh, I think that it's built on some google.org stuff. And uh, I don't understand all the technology behind it. But I uh, wanted to, to bring this out as, a, as an example of what you can do um, if you really try. 
And so I would say build these design projects with the ability, the flexibility to code switch. I'm not saying that everything needs to be this way, but think about it and make sure that as you grow and as you, you build, you can flex that way. Something which is perhaps uh, a little bit darker, no pun intended, and that is our depictions of the other in design and in art. I showed this example at a conference in Sweden some years ago. It was about a year and a half, two years ago. And what we have is an ad campaign for Air France. And you'll see there on the left-hand side a beautiful, beautiful piece of graphic design. There is no doubt about that. And if you look at the whole campaign, you'll really be pretty surprised. I mean, this is, it's great stuff, great photography, it's great layout. And this is advertising flights to Dakar for about 700 euros. And yet, uh, you see that all of these works that they did in the whole campaign was based on these much older Air France posters. Here we see an example of one of the older Air France posters in which we have the savage man, subhuman, with his savage spawn, subhuman, and they've killed an even more unhuman beast, which is bleeding out in the bottom of their canoe. There's not a sign of modernity anywhere in this poster except for that tiny little silver dot in the corner of the Air France plane flying above all of this, probably going back to Europe. And <laughs> it's funny to me <laughs> on a lot of different levels, uh, being West African, but the, the poster, uh, the, the newer one anyway, we have uh, a white European model um, who has face paint. Uh, not all of the other posters are like this, let me just say. And is also wearing gele, the you know, traditional uh, African headdress. Anyway, you know, I, I pointed this out at the, at the conference and was kind of like, this is a little bit weird. And there are other examples from that campaign as well. Well, as you would probably imagine, somebody came up to me later and says, uh, you know, I really disagree with your characterization of um, these designers' intent. And that's fine. You know, that's kind of the point of this. Uh, it was a weird short conversation that I had with them. But something that he said really, uh, you know, made me scratch my head. And it was that, uh, you know, these new posters are simply to get uh, white European tourist uh, to travel to Dakar more. And if you've ever been on a flight to West Africa before, you'll know that this is kind of what they look like. Um, this is my lived experience coming to and from home. And so I think that there's a huge disconnect between the stereotypes and the assumptions that we make about a certain culture and the way that that manifests itself in the design that we do. In contrast, uh, we have some work which is absolutely beautiful for its intent. Uh, I'm not a fashion designer, and so I can't speak to the quality of the work itself. But Osklin, uh, a fashion brand, worked with the uh, Ashaninka people and examined their fabric, their painting techniques, uh, their color usage, and went into a partnership with them. And so part of the proceeds of this spring 2016 campaign go to them as part creators. And it really strikes me as a much more calculated and interesting way to depict not the other, but we in a you know, very varied form. Sometimes we can actually build complete digital narratives uh, that help to break down some of these stereotypes and, and move things forward. Now, a few years ago, I came across um, Namban art and if you've ever studied uh, you know, Japanese history or whatever, you'll know that Namban art is a form of artwork that came around around the 1600s that depicted Portuguese and later on Dutch and, and other uh, sailors and explorers, traders, that came to the shores of Japan. And this is a prime example of when we have an established nation, established culture, the Japanese, who depicted some people as the other. And we can see here, down at the bottom, there are a number of African sailors in their big kind of pantaloons. And we have some of the uh, white Portuguese sailors as well. And it got me thinking, what were these men's lives actually like? Often when we talk about the age of exploration around this time, uh, we hear about Vasco da Gama. But he wasn't the one actually doing the rigging. He wasn't caulking the boat. It was these men who were doing it. And so what is that story? And how can we challenge a pre-existing idea about the age of exploration? And so I decided to build this, this story, uh, which is a digital narrative, uh, the journey of Captain da Costa, and uh, wrote a series of diary entries written ostensibly by Captain da Costa, uh, a series of illustrations as well, uh, and 
contextualize that with art and other material from that time. And really wanting to let people explore the stuff that he wrote, he as in the character, explore the things that he drew, uh, and then also see what else was happening in the world. Here are some examples that Rita Sabler, an illustrator that I've worked with before, uh, did. And so these are technically Captain DaCosta's drawings. And really, really, really trying to find a way to break that stereotype of what it was like in the 16th century for African sailors. And I want to be able to give people permission to explore that nuance and not always rely on tropes or uh, pat kind of characterizations. Other people do it a lot better. And Yinka Shonabare, the best of us, uh, a Nigerian uh, British artist. Uh, he's been awarded the MBE by the Queen. Uh, he is, he's tops. And he does a very, very interesting thing where he takes clothing, which is technically from kind of a white European perspective, often from three, 400 years ago. And then he reclothes them in African wax print fabric. Now, if you know anything about wax print fabric, you'll know that it is a very interesting history that it's got. During the days of the Dutch East India Company, they were in Southeast Asia and they found wax resist technology. They took that technology, not discovered it, but they took it anyway, and they brought it back to Europe. They said, wow, we can really do something with this on an industrial scale. They began to print on cotton cloth with bright colors. Cotton cloth that came from the slave colonies on this continent, and then also cotton manufactured and, and grown in West Africa. Put it all on rolls, printed it, and then sold it back into West Africa as this African wax print fabric. So you have all of this really, really weird stuff going on where what we identify as truly African fabric <laughs> is not at all until very recently. And so he recognizes this, and he starts to do very interesting things with it. One of his more famous projects is taking that and reclothing a symbol that we have of, first of all, American might and American power, uh, but also perhaps white male power, and making them into these wax print astronauts. Uh, it's really, really, really interesting. He also does other things where we take branding in a very clever way. And you can see Chanel number no. five, featured very prominently on some 18th century French uh, get-ups. And so when I talk about appropriation and when I talk about uh, stereotypes, uh, I think this is the type of work that really can challenge that. And the point I'll make here is that appropriation always punches up. Uh, we always want to find a way to subvert, either very casually, slyly, sarcastically, uh, pre prevailing power norms. And so when we take work from one place, we always want to make sure that we're punching upwards and not downwards. So you're probably thinking, all right, that's cool, and it is cool. So what are some of the steps that we can actually take? And I'll try and give you a few, and this is not an exhaustive list, uh, but I hope this helps you in your own practice, uh, and I try to bring these things into my practice as well. And of course, another quick warning, um, that we can say culture eats strategy for breakfast. All of the things that we do and all the planning that we make probably won't survive first contact with the enemy, quote unquote, uh, but we can try anyway. The first thing that I would encourage you to do is have a very, very flexible research outlook. And again, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of an example, but what I'm talking about here is building and executing research, design research, UX research, content research, that allows for cultural and regional differences uh, rather than trying to fit it into what you think is the correct way that it should go. Speaking again about Nigeria, one of the problems that my country has uh, on a lot of times, there's a lot of problems, but I'll focus on one of them for now, and that is uh, access to healthcare. Um, Nigeria has really been at the forefront of a lot of very uh, poor decisions <laughs> when it comes to health for the masses. And we see a lot of health clinics. Uh, my parents were instrumental in setting some of these up, which don't anymore respond to the needs of the populace. And so a project that came about between Reboot.org, which is in Brooklyn and uh, also in Nigeria, and the World Bank. And the World Bank was simply saying, why is it that people aren't really going to these clinics? And why is it that even though we know that there's problems, they don't really let us know what's going on? 
And so Reboot decided to go in and actually do some real research. And so they asked people a bunch of questions, as you do, and they found out a number of things. Uh, first of all, the opening and closing times of the clinic were very opaque and difficult to de decipher. Uh, getting feedback to the people who mattered, which are the policymakers and the politicians, often meant calling people on their own personal phone because there was no central switchboard or whatever for, um, you know, for feedback. And uh, you know, another big one, of course, is people needed to go after work in the evenings, but there was no light, there was no power. And so what Reboot did uh, was after analyzing all of this, they said, well, look, uh, people have phones. Why don't we set up an SMS system where they can text their representatives, they can text the clinic, and start to give them their feedback. And so immediately, we see some action starting to happen. Uh, the local government found some money from somewhere to buy a generator for the clinic in this area so that people could go after dark. And so simply by getting out of the way, asking some of those questions, and trying to build a research strategy which addressed who they were talking to rather than their own conceptions, we suddenly have uh, an increase in health outcomes in this tiny little village in the middle of nowhere. So my tip, of course, is to test design that really exposes those technical and those cultural experiences. Find ways to tease those out. The next strategy is that of forgiving interfaces. And I'll explain a little bit of what I mean here. That is, we often build things to do one thing. And that can often be quite effective. But more and more what we're seeing is interfaces, services, APIs that allow us to do a number of different and concurrent things. Uh, we are, unfortunately or fortunately, maybe a multitasking uh, world now. And so what does this mean for the products and the services that we're building and that we're designing? One amazing example, of course, is WeChat. Uh, there's the WeChat wallet now, which is huge, probably huger than you would know if it's not something that you use. Um, and there are so many applications for this. It's amazing. You can do all sorts of things by hooking into their systems. You can build entire businesses on their platform. And I imagine it like this membrane that's kind of laying across society. And that's kind of a weird metaphor, but it is because you can touch it in any way that you want and you can hook into it in a lot of different ways. I think the greatest example that I saw was uh, an entirely uh, you know, WeChat-based uh, messaging and you know, booking system or whatever for a daycare in which uh, whenever somebody came to pick up your kid, then their picture would be texted to your WeChat account and you could see who it was that picked up you know, little Johnny or whatever uh, from daycare. And that's all within this ecosystem. It's this layer that's on top and is extremely flexible. It's not a one-track thing anymore. In the uh, Atlanta Civil Rights Museum, uh, which was just built a few years ago, we see a different and very, very uh, perhaps alternate example of this. And we, t we can talk about flexible interfaces being things that I can do a bunch of stuff with, uh, but perhaps also flexible interfaces are, and forgiving interfaces are ways to allow our society itself to forgive and to begin to come to terms with things. And so here we see a, a haptic interface in which we have a representation of the lunch counter desegregation movement. Um, and for those of you who don't know, this was an extremely traumatic time in American history. Uh, I learned when I got here all about it, in which uh, African men and women would go to lunch counters, uh, which were uh, whites only, sit down and demand, as is their right, to be fed. They would be punched, kicked, stabbed with knives and forks, have feces thrown on them, both dog and human, who knows. And throughout all of that, uh, through this principle of nonviolent resistance, they would need to sit there, with their hands on the table, and not move, and simply ask for their food. It's very doubtful that anybody in this room could do that today. And so, you know, we must give credit to them for being able to stick through that. But in a small way, it's possible for us to start to experience what this is like. And so you see here this interface where you put your hands down on the counter, you put on some headphones, you hear the abuse hurled at you, and you can't move your hands. And only when you've had enough, you pull up your hands and you see how many, how many minutes, not hours, how many minutes you got. So it looks like this guy right here is at six minutes and 59 seconds, so about seven minutes. And you really need to ask yourself how long you could last if you haven't been there before. 
And I see this as an interface that allows us to start to forgive ourselves as a society uh, for some things which have happened and continue to happen. So really design these forgiving interfaces, ones that flex across cultures, uh, that act as a membrane uh, that all of us can hook into. The third strategy is that of layered language, uh, really looking at multilingualism in an increasingly multilingual world. This was a, a branding project done by Studio Feed in Montreal. Uh, the typographer's name is Jean-Baptiste Levé, and this is for Air Inuit. And there's nothing incredibly special about this, right? It, it's, it's a cool project. It's for a small airline. They fly in the, the far north of Canada. I've never been there. I don't know what it's like. But you look at the typography, and you see not only do they account for English, they account for French, and they also account for Inuktitut. And so we have this multilingual, in more than a Romance languages way, uh, that I believe they call this Inuit Sands, Air Inuit Sands. Um, and it's a beautiful little example of what you can do when you put a little bit extra on your design and branding projects. So here's another personal project. And you know, kind of like I keep bringing up, I try to explore these things in my own work uh, and in the, the personal things that I do. And Holo Halo was a, a project that I worked on a year and a half or two years ago, really exploring what it means for science fiction, in the near future anyway, to have interfaces uh, that are augmented uh, and ways to augment our own personality and make it visible. And so you can see here one of the halos. Uh, depending on her mood, the halo's around her neck there, you can see it. Depending on her mood, this will change, morph, edit itself, and read her body language. One of the other things I did on the site was to make sure that people with vestibular disorders or who weren't really comfortable with the, um, you know, the, the animation could turn that on and off, so just as an accessibility thing. But I really wanted to dig in what it meant, uh, not only to speak a different language, but to have this t completely visual language portrayed around your head. Uh, you can see another example here of somebody I'm terming a, you know, a data scientist or a scientist, and she um, you know, has a particular mood around her um, as she's either working or communicating with somebody. And so really, really, really trying to ask a question of what does multilingualism look like, not only with language, but then also with sci-fi interfaces. Um, I love science fiction, so if I haven't said that already, this was a really, really fun one. And so I would just ask you know, to create projects that have multilingual contexts. I'm not saying that you need to localize all your websites. Don't do that unless you know what you're doing. Um, but find ways to hook into it in a way that makes sense. The last one is trying to find a way to build a sense of place. And this can mean place in the physical sense, uh, but it can also mean place in the sense of that place in your heart. And so uh, I'll show you an example from Constructive where I work. Uh, the RAP is the Regulatory Assistance Project. Um, they are the coolest people that you've never heard of before. Um, and what they do is build support and write climate change regulation. Um, they work to decarbonize our energy grid, and they also work to build consensus around regulators across the world for what we need to stop burning so much oil and so much coal. Um, and they came to us and they said, look, we need a new site, we need a new brand, we need to really make it clear how important this work is. And so uh, working with Constructive, uh, you know, my agency, uh, developer John, who was there at the time, we came up with this idea that we are going to illustrate the places that they work. These are their regions. And they're all the largest kind of you know, polluting regions in the world. And of course, me, I'm there, like, wouldn't it be really cool if we could look from like the North Pole and see all these places. And so you have this kind of, you know, this map. And so we built it. Some SVG, a little bit of HTML, like it's cool. And we got this up on the staging site and uh, a few days before go live, we get a Dun Dun ticket and uh, the rap people say, look, we got a problem. The map is wrong. <laughs> Well, what do you mean it's wrong? Like, I downloaded this from Wikipedia. Like, it's got to be correct, right? <laughs> well, they said um, the map of India is clearly wrong, and the map of China is not right either. And, of course, talking to them a little bit more and doing our research, we then realize, stupid us, that there are a number of regions between China, between India, that are still disputed. Uh, wars were fought, and people lost their lives over these little pieces of land in the Himalayas. Well, I needed to go back in, re-edit that SVG map, and make sure that on click, 
we maintain the integrity of these nations. Um, and so their sense of place uh, remains static. Last project that I wanted to focus on is one that's probably nearest and dearest to my heart. Uh, Lost Nigeria is uh, an ode to my mother. Uh, she passed away some years ago. And uh, when I was in Nigeria visiting my dad the last time, I came across all of this slide film that she had taken in the 1960s and 1970s. And uh, my mom was a California girl. She graduated from high school and went to school in Michigan, interestingly enough. Uh, and then in 1961, she moved to Nigeria. This is a year after independence. And there was so much promise in the nation. Finally, an African nation standing up on their own, we're gonna do this and we're gonna do it just like everybody else. And my mom was there for that. And she was a nurse at a leprosy settlement and was really there to aid and to help people in building this nation. I don't know who these two kids are. Um, they're just some random kids, but it's a cool picture of my mom, so. <laughs> just thought I'd show it to you. And throughout looking at all these pictures, I was just fascinated so much by this sense of place. And there's one example in particular that I'll show you. And so here we have uh, a photo that my mom took when she was in Nairobi, I believe. And she traveled there for a few years while the civil war was raging in Nigeria. And we have all the trappings of modern society. We have security. We have the international jets. Um, we've got cars and we've got the stairs and the tarmac and the drainage system and all of that. And right in the middle, there's a guy wearing khakis with his pet lion. And I can only imagine what was going through my mother's head as she took this picture and as she must have realized very, very, very clearly, like I am not in California anymore. <laughs> and so in building some of these personal projects, I really tried to identify, you know, in nuanced ways anyway. Uh, to create that sense of belonging and to show who she was, uh, both for myself and for others, um, and, and build that sense of place um, in my personal work. So uh, I'll leave you with a final note, um, and probably as simple as it can be, is that culture does inform every part of our design practice. Now, I've showed examples of where people are doing it particularly well, and other examples where people maybe didn't do it so well. I didn't do it so well. But Throughout all the things that you do, look at those cultural variables, uh, look at some of those tropes and stereotypes that might creep into your work, and try to identify ways to, to fight against that and to build a much more multicultural uh, and inclusive design practice. So, thank you. Thank you so much for talking and sharing your life story. It's, it's inspiring. I'm curious, as you explore cultures and taboos, have you learned how to like create thresholds and how that's altered your process as you get near that gray area and slowly learn from different projects? So about thresholds, when you get to the, the danger zone, there's a lot of bad ways to, you know, to, to get in trouble. And I think the simplest one is probably to stop and ask for help. Um, you know, if I'm doing a project that references design culture in I don't know, Malaysia. I'm gonna not do anything until I find somebody who's from Malaysia to speak to and ask them a few questions at least. And I think that that's part of what we should be doing as design researchers and you know, uh, visual, visual people. If you don't have access to that, then I still think that research holds. Uh, you know, The simple example is just to go on Behance and uh, do a filter search and kind of see what other people have been doing. Um, I mean, that's mostly for visual culture, but if you are doing you know, user experience stuff or app design or whatever, like, talk to somebody. Hi, thank you so much for sharing. Um, I am a marketer, so I'm, I, although I don't do design, but I do do a lot of consumer research. I know in the CPG world, when we do consumer research, traditionally we, we basically send out surveys and have people say, you know, what's my preference? And uh, we find out that a lot of the times people, what people say doesn't mean what they will actually do. So for example, people will say that I prefer a healthier lifestyle where they still do, you know, eat a lot of indulgent food. Um, I'm curious though, you know, in the designing world, in your experience, do you find um, any experience, or do you have an experience that, you know, what 
your research uh, audience say doesn't mean what they actually care about, what they do. And then is there any new research methods that can avoid this or maybe really inspire the right direction for product design or content design or service design? So I'm not a design researcher. Uh, I'm not a UX researcher, although we do that. So uh, what I know will be superficial at best. So having said that, um, I'll just tell you a little story. When I worked at Cambridge University Press, um, the oldest publisher in the world, and uh, you know, a very venerable institution with a lot of clout behind them. And somebody says, you know what? We're going to have an iPad in every classroom. And this is a great idea. The teachers love it. All the teachers are like, we need to use technology more. <laughs> and so they did a few trials, and it failed miserably. And people bought the iPads, and they just kind of sat there. Now, I'm not saying that it's a bad idea, but we were dealing with English language teaching. And it needed to be verbal. It needed to be people like actually interacting with each other and not just tapping Q&A on their, their tablets. And probably what we should have done is just sat in the classrooms for a little bit and watched what was happening rather than go out and build a teaching app <laughs> for an iPad that was never going to get used. So, you know, to answer your question, in the marketing world, and I, I did work at marketing in Cambridge, um, there can be, I think, a rush to just kind of think you know it all, but perhaps ask the questions of the customers and then watch what happens building small prototypes and that sort of thing can help. Um, but again, not being a pure design researcher, it's difficult for me to say. Uh, going back to one of your earlier examples with, um, I believe, the, the fashion designer uh, who... The uh, Nigerian-British guy? The Nigerian-British guy? Yinka no, Shonobar? before that, um, making uh, garments inspired by... Ah, uh, the, the Osklin team, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that is a, is a positive example. Yeah. Um, in, in what ways can we be critical of that too, though? Because I think we have a lot of, a lot of this that um, kind of seems like it falls in the gray zone between, is that appropriation? And then are we truly benefiting these people? Could you speak more specifically about that? So I would say for that Osklin example, it probably would be best to go and see the video that they made. Now look, it, it's marketing, I get that. Um, you know, we're in late capitalism at this point and this is all gonna come crashing down on us sooner rather than later. But uh, while the getting is good, people are out there getting it. And so Osklin is, they're getting it. And the video that they made, you know, they go into the community and they, uh, they talk to the people, kind of examine what it is that they're doing. And so it's definitely in that gray area because it is, sales and it is people selling clothing and so on. But I do think that they treated it in a very respectful way. Um, and the, the guy who runs the, the organization, you know, he went along. He didn't just like send his junior team members to go out into the Amazon. Uh, he went along with them and was able to kind of steer the creative direction. So yeah, I think him being there and him leading it and him making sure that there was a financial incentive for both sides uh, was a good way to steer a little bit away from the, the danger zone. Sorry, can I can I follow up on that just a little bit? Um, I guess I'm also really curious about uh, whether or not that's the type of message w we're deciding is okay. Like, uh, I understand. Yes, there's a there's a respect that's really super important, um, and a treatment that they did that's great. But uh, is it? It's still it's still the usage of of an exotic form that sells a product. And is that problematic fundamentally? Is, is that something that's okay to propagate? Because does that not go back to the, the Air France posters a little bit? Yeah, I think it, you're correct in hitting on you know, the, the central kind of difficulty with all of this is finding that line. And we're never gonna be able to say this is right and this isn't. Uh, I mean, it's, it's fine and well to do it here, to say this is a good example. Um, but there's always gonna be a little bit of give and take. Um, we're not ever gonna eliminate this idea that people can take others' stuff without their asking. Um, that's just simply a facet of our culture uh, globally. Uh, but again, I think doing so in a way that acknowledges what you're doing, like I'm gonna do something, but I'm also gonna say that I'm doing it and make sure that people know that I know what I'm doing uh, can be a more effective way to go about it. Um, 
hopefully the money that is going to the, uh, the tribe is used for some good, is used for education for the children, and so on and so forth. But I, I don't know the details about that, so. Well, if there aren't any more questions, um, I just want to say thank you, Sonongo, for those very uh, valuable um, principles and strategies for multicultural design. And uh, we really appreciate you coming to Google to speak with us. So thank you very much. <laughs>